freedom. We have all grown familiar with this term freedom. Many of us like this idea, but few of us are aware of the significant differences in two of the primary conceptualizations of freedom in the Western tradition, the humanist and nihilist understandings of freedom. For the sake of brevity, I will focus on only two of the representatives of the humanist and nihilist conceptions of freedom, John Milton and Friedrich Nietzsche, respectively. Not all philosophies of freedom are the same, even if they share the same terminology. This is something that all students of philosophy quickly learn. Though the language and rhetoric of freedom is universal, the meaning people attach to it is not. The humanist understanding of freedom is born from two older ideas. The rational cosmos of the Greeks, found in, say, Pythagoras, Plato, the Stoics, etc., and the moral law from Christianity. John Milton was arguably the most famous modern representative of this inheritance. In the Areopagitica, Milton famously argued against censorship and gave an impassioned defense of free thought, free speech, and the basic foundations of the humanist ideals of freedom. The heart of the Areopagitica rests on a humanist presupposition many of us are otherwise completely ignorant of. Freedom as a means, but not the end of itself. For Milton, the importance of, of the freedom articulated in the Areopagitica was freedom from external forces to compel the individual conscious to choose the good, which would, by definition, be a form of unfreedom. The humanist conception of freedom is that since there is a moral law and moral universe knowable by human reason, the soul, and since we as human beings possess free will, we ourselves as individuals are capable of knowing the moral good and the moral cosmos and choosing the good for ourselves without any outside compulsion. This is what our freedom is principally about. The freedom to choose the good will bring about human flourishing. The humanist defense of freedom is also contingently opposed, as mentioned, to external forces compelling us to the good, be it a state, a church, or other humans. Note for Milton and all the humanists, principally the Renaissance humanists who influence Milton, this is not that they necessarily disagree with the understanding of the moral good of external institutions or forces. They may very well agree with that moral understanding of those outside forces. They may also disagree, as Milton clearly does throughout the pages of the Aereo. Regardless, if these outside forces compel us to choose the good, then we abrogate our own nature, our free choosing nature, our free will, and therefore are unfree or enslaved. The opposition to outside forces in the humanist tradition isn't to a moral law or a moral universe, as lying propagandists or those simply ignorant of the humanist intellectual tradition claim. The humanist opposition is to externalities, compelling humans to choose the moral law, to be in conformity with the moral universe. As individuals, the humanists are telling us, we can know and therefore choose the good ourselves. No outside force, no priest, no pope, no king, no soldier, no president, no member of parliament need tell us what we ourselves can know and choose on our own volition. Humanist conceptualiz conceptualizations of freedom, then, grew out of the free will theologies of Christianity and in response to the theological determinism of Calvinism and then later Newtonianism in science. The key spirit for the humanists was that our free choice, our free will, was the bridge between the self and the moral good, 
which was the wellspring and the oasis of our flourishing. The humanist sought to safeguard the freedom of the self to choose the good for itself, which was knowable at the individual level, which circumvented the need for any external collective enforcement. Anyone familiar, for instance, with the deep intellectual traditions that moved the humanists of the Renaissance, the humanists of the early modern period, to which Milton is the most famous example of, or the American founding fathers, and even the so-called classical liberals of the 19th century, know that it was not moral relativism that these men and women adhered to, but the free will and free choice of a rational creature who could know the moral good of the universe and choose it for themselves without the need of any external parties forcing compulsion onto the individual. The humanist conception of freedom, then, ensures individual freedom in a moral universe with a knowable nature that we can imitate, hence the formation of the philosophies of natural rights and natural law from the humanist idea of freedom, that no person, no state, no law can violate, and the proper purpose of government is to imitate the knowable natural law which extends natural rights to all. This conception of freedom differs radically from the freedom envisioned by the nihilists, the modern version of freedom most famously espoused by Friedrich Nietzsche. Nihilism is not necessarily the belief that there is no inherent meaning to the universe, although the nihilist recognizes that there isn't. The nihilist Moreover, recognizes that we do, in fact, live by values in this meaningless universe to sustain a meaningful existence in life. What the nihilist understanding is, is that there is no objective standard of values, no inherent meaning to our lives and the universe, and because of this, we create ourselves the values and the meanings by which to live by. Nietzsche wasn't the first, but he was the most famous philosopher who came to terms with the ramifications of what it meant if there was no moral law, no moral universe, and no rational standard for human existence. Nietzsche does not deny human free will. He is very much part of the voluntarist tradition stretching back to St. Augustine and carried forward by the humanists to his own time in this regard. Nietzsche and the humanists share this idea of human free choice. Where Nietzsche breaks with the classical Christian inheritance is in the belief of a rational cosmos, the Greeks, and the moral law, Christianity, Nietzsche asserts that there is no rational cosmos and that there is no moral law. The post-Socratic philosophers invented the idea of a rational cosmos to give them a meaning to live by, just like how Christians invented the idea of a moral law in order to live by. Nietzsche's genealogy of morals and beyond good and evil are instructive in the nihilist understanding of freedom. In an irrational universe, without a moral law and no natural rights, all there is is struggle, conflict and strife, the conflict and strife to create the values by which we live by. Freedom is found in the self-creation of values, which becomes the perpetual self-creation of values which sublate the older values which came before us. Here, Nietzsche very much is a radical Hegelian, despite his formal rejection of Hegel's philosophy of historicism. As all scholars of Nietzsche know, despite his animosity against Hegel and his heirs, Nietzsche himself was something of a radical Hegelian, a radical historicist, who simply, like Marx, turned Hegel on his head. The contest of values is the contest of opposing freedoms, and one side wins out against the other and then imposes its values over people. This explains why people have lived 
by different values at different points in time throughout history. It is not, as Hegel says, a progression to the true reality of the moral and rational cosmos. It is simply a reflection of the contest of force. Because humanity exists in a meaningless cosmos that is irrational or without any rationality to it, that means there is no universal and objective standard by which we can live by. We, therefore, create the standards by which to live by to endure in this meaningless world. Freedom, for Nietzsche, is the self-exertion to self-creation, the self-overcoming, that struggle for self-overcoming. Freedom is found in our constant struggling with others, struggling with the world, struggling with ourselves to create new values to live and to never be satisfied with the inherited values of others or even the values we temporarily create for ourselves for any sustained period of time. We must constantly strive and struggle to overcome. Self-overcoming and self-creation is a perpetual project. This is the relativist understanding of freedom. My values I create to live by may not be the same as yours, but we all create or inherit values to make sense of our meaningless existence. For Nietzsche and the nihilist understanding of freedom, in contradistinction with the humanist understanding of freedom, we should be able to now see how we are really talking about two different understandings of freedom, even if they both share the superficial similarity in free choice. In the humanist understanding of freedom, free choice is the free choice to live by the rational standard of a knowable nature and a knowable universe. This is why we get the idea of natural law and natural rights. The nihilist understanding of freedom is that that is all BS, that there is no objective standard. There is no knowable standard to the universe. All there is is the struggle to create our own values to live by, and that is what freedom is about. It would behoove us not to mention how one can see the relativist understanding of freedom as serving as an inspiration for the revolutionary movements of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Even though Nietzsche was not himself a fascist or a communist and had much to criticize in the early fascistic and communist movements of his own time, the nihilist understanding of freedom would become a pillar of both fascist and communist philosophy, as the philosopher R. L. Kolnai explained in his 1938 book, The War on the West. Fascism took from nihilism the belief that freedom was found in struggle, in conflict, and that particular people would live by particular values. The values of the Aryan German, for instance, would be different than those of the Anglo-Celt, etc. Communism took from nihilism the understanding that natural law and natural rights were self-creations of the bourgeoisie, the values by which the bourgeoisie entrenched their power over other people, and communism was simply exposing the naturalistic fallacy of bourgeois values. Again, now we should see how these two philosophical schools of freedom are radically different from each other. The humanist understanding of freedom ultimately sees freedom as the means to a higher end, and freedom becomes the universal bridge for all people to manifest that higher reality in their own life. What the humanist safeguards against is any external force telling the individual what the moral good is. The humanist is convinced that individuals by themselves can know the moral good and choose to live by the moral law on their own. And in doing this, human flourishing and happiness will be manifested. The humanist conception of freedom ends in the philosophy, as we've mentioned, of natural rights and natural liberties underpinned by natural law, the moral law of the universe, which we can all know and live by. 
The nihilist understanding of freedom ultimately sees freedom as the only end in of itself because the only thing that matters is the self-creation of values to live by in a meaningless universe. There is no moral good. There is no moral law. There is no rational cosmos. These were just the values created by earlier people to make sense of their own miserable, meaningless life. Therefore, there are no natural rights, no natural liberties, no natural law. All there is is strife, conflict, and struggle. And in this strife, conflict, and struggle, the self-exertion of self-creation is found. And this is what freedom is all about. The simple self-exertion and self-creation and the self-overcoming of creating values by which to live by. There is no ultimate flourishing or human happiness to be found. All there is is the freedom to self-create. Today in the Western world, and more broadly speaking, the entire world, these two conceptions of freedom predominate. When one speaks of freedom, one must begin to peel back the veil of what the person means. Whether they are speaking of freedom within the humanist school, which leads to natural rights and natural liberties, or the nihilist school, where freedom is the end of itself, where freedom is found in the self-creation of our values to make sense of a meaningless existence. Just because you hear people talk about freedom doesn't actually mean they are talking about the same understanding and the same conceptualization of freedom. As just mentioned, in our world today, it is a contest of freedom, a contest of two conceptions of freedom, the humanist understanding of freedom and the nihilist understanding of freedom.